Welcome to the 99th episode of the Flipped Learning Network podcast. I'm your host, Troy Cockrum. Uh, my co-host, Joan Brown, is traveling this week, so she is not here. Um, but I'm doing a podcast today um, on podcasting. And Joan and I will follow up with a second part of this podcast next week, um, talking more specifically about the educational uses of podcasting. But I wanted to get someone on who was very familiar with podcasting in general and starting and building a podcast and so I went to the only full-time podcaster that I know which is Rob Sesternino. Rob, welcome to the show. Troy, you couldn't have saved me for the 100th episode? <laughs> um, well, we had a, a little scheduling snafu and, and just, um, you know, Joan and I decided to do a special uh, episode next week for the 100th episode, so... I hope you're not disappointed to not be the 100th episode. Only a little. <laughs> Only a little. But I've, I've, I've had worse disappointments. <laughs> um, so tell, tell, the, tell my listeners, because I'm sure they're not familiar. Most of them are probably not very familiar with who you are. Tell them about the history of how you became a full-time podcaster. Sure. Uh, my background is that uh, about... 10, well, more than 10 now, uh, about uh, 11 or 12 years ago, I was a contestant on the TV show Survivor, and I actually did that two times in a year, uh, basically, in uh, 2002 uh, to 2003, and I sort of became a person who was, um, you know, known from that show, uh, which led me to uh, come out to start working in production uh, out here in Los Angeles, and I did that for a, a while, for basically until uh, 2010. And I had a lot of uh, different, you know, uh, success, uh, you know, successes and misses along the way, working in online video and sort of, you know, figuring out how to do online marketing. And so, at a point when you know the job market was slow back in 2000 and uh, 2009, which I think it was probably the case for a lot of people at that time. I sort of, you know, ended up learning to uh, make a website and then ultimately learning how to do podcasting because I didn't really know what else to do at that at that time and it sort of was just, you know, a hobby in a way to sort of like get my reel out there to people. And in early 2010, I started podcasting about TV and I really haven't ever uh, looked back since. And we've, you know, grown the podcast to talk about more and more shows besides just Survivor, and we have uh, really all of the major reality shows covered at this point, and then this year I branched off into covering scripted shows, too, on a second podcast. Yeah, so you do, um, Rob has a podcast, yes. uh, which is where I started listening to you at, I think roughly five years ago is, is wow. when I joined, and that's right around the very beginning of it, wasn't it? Yes, uh, uh, 2010 was when it, when, when it kicked off, so you okay. were in on the ground floor. Um, and then you started post show recap. So how many shows average do you do a week? It depends on what's in season. Um, there was one week uh, in the spring. I think I did 17 podcasts between uh, Sunday to Friday, and that I think that was the record. I think 17 is the most I've done on a typical week. Now I'm, it's probably closer to eight or nine, but you know it's a lot. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, your technical setup here in a minute um, because I had to learn a lot about how to set up a, a podcast on the technical side so that I wouldn't burn myself out with just one podcast a week. So, um, But I wanted to mention that you're, you're in Los Angeles now, which we have a lot of listeners that are out in California, but you, you uh, used to live in Wataw, New York. Is that correct? Wataw, yeah. Um, I did a a collaboration with a with a teacher at Wonton Middle School roughly about five years ago. We oh did wow! A, we did a compare and contrast essay wiki with her students, and we talked about the different sites and and different things in our town. And funny thing, she never did once mention that you were uh, a a celebrity from Wonton. <laughs> wow! You know, what do you? How dare they? I'm gonna I'm gonna speak with the mayor. <laughs> well, the next time I get home. Um, so, what is what is your technical setup? I mean, I use a snowball mic here, yeah, um, and just a, a Logitech HD camera, um, and I don't 
soundproof my room or anything, but I mean, the, the viewers can see that you, you've got a lot of setup there. Tell me about your technical setup. Yeah, so what I end up doing here, and I've certainly over the, you know, almost five years that I've been doing the podcast, my setup has evolved from where, you know, I started where I had like one, like, you know, kind used USB microphone, and then the other microphone was from uh, the game Garage Band for the PlayStation, and I said, oh, this fits in the USB on the computer, this will work, and so I had basically two microphones in the same room, and we realized that that was sort of like creating an echo, so me and my wife, who was doing the shows, uh, she was my fiancé at the time, uh, we just then both like talked into the same microphone for a while, basically, I had it sort of on the desk, and we both talked into it, uh, but now at this point, the show has evolved to the point where uh, this is a uh, Heil PR40 microphone that I am talking into. It's an XLR mic. Uh, it goes into a mixer, uh, which is uh, down over here. And so uh, the mixer ends up, I have sort of a, uh, a mix minus, and tell me if I'm being uh, too technical with some, of these, with some of these terms. But So what I'm able to do is then the person that I'm talking to, like yourself or on Skype, uh, I have, I'm talking to you on a separate computer, and that computer has the headphone jack going into the mixer, but I have the auxiliary turned all the way down, so you're not hearing yourself back. And so I'm, I'm recording your, uh, if I was doing, if this was my show, I'd be recording your audio and my audio, and then both of those tracks are, would come over to this computer uh, where I'm running Adobe Audition and then I'm recording each track separate. So I'm recording my audio uh, is on the top track, and then the person who I am speaking with, their audio is on the second track, and then I can sort of adjust the levels as be and sort of make an edit if I need to, and then also add my theme music and other stuff like that onto a, a separate track altogether. And what um, I use Audacity, which for those out there who don't know is a free audio editor. What do you use to audit, to edit your audio? Uh, so I use Adobe Audition uh, at this point in time. Uh, I used for the first four some odd years. I'm only on Audition like less than six months uh, since I made that upgrade. Uh, I was on GarageBand for the uh, longest time, and you know that. You know, there's nothing wrong with with GarageBand. Uh, certainly not as bell as many bells and whistles as uh, Adobe Audition or even Audacity. You know, there's, uh, you know, I know some people who, you know, they have Audition and they choose to use uh, Audacity because they like some of the things that are in Audacity. So, uh, GarageBand is very, you know, sort of, you know, out of the box, and there's not a ton of, you know other sort of, like, you can't really get too uh, in-depth with it, but it's good. It's a good uh, sort of starter, uh, you know, audio editing program. And I learned um, the more that you edit, the more you burn yourself out and um, learn that uh, go with go with the most, uh, the, the recording that you have and not take the time to spend, you know, a lot of time editing unless you have a lot of free time to do that. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you listen to any of my shows, you know I don't do a lot of editing, Troy. <laughs> you, you, you put good out points. I usually listen to all of the entire episodes, but you put good out points just in case somebody doesn't want to listen to the entire episode. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I figure if anybody makes it to the end, because I do some long podcasts, I'm so happy that, and uh, you know, I'm thrilled that anybody's even listening in the first place, and then I'm even more thrilled if somebody makes it all the way to the end. It didn't turn it, didn't turn it off uh, <laughs> being mad halfway through. Um, and it's it's interesting that you should mention the um, the 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 ec are you I would hear myself back if you didn't do the the uh, mixer and the separate tracks. I had Dan Geesling on about a year ago, and he he called he called in, and it was not the way I expected, so I had to patch him in, and he was re hearing himself back the whole time, but he never said anything. Um, and I didn't realize it until I listened to the recording that I had two tracks of him, and so. He was a trooper to continue the interview because I know how difficult it is when you keep hearing yourself back. So. Yeah, but maybe he just loves to hear himself talk, and so that <laughs> was that was like a double bonus for him. He's like, "Wow, I get to do the interview and hear myself in the interview." 
Um, so one, one other question I wanted to go, get to. Um, well, I'm a Google certified teacher, which means I have a professional relationship with Google. Um, and uh, Google Plus is a, is a, lo uh, a lot of teachers have a love-hate relationship with Google Plus. They yeah. see the benefit of it, but see, also see the downsides of it um, as far as using it with students and things like that. You've been able to use not only Google Plus, but a lot of social media quite well. Can you explain how you've sort of integrated social media to build your podcast? Yeah, I feel like that the lifeblood of a podcast is interactivity and sort of the way that you do interactivity other than, other than comments and stuff like email I, I think is mostly through social media and I feel like social media is what turns a podcast into sort of like its own sort of living, breathing thing that everybody is getting engaged with and ideally when you do social media well on a podcast it's not just you talking to the people that listen to the podcast it's people who listen to the podcast talking to each other and I think that's what really fosters a community around a podcast I use Twitter a lot Facebook was probably a bigger part of the show early on but there's still a part of the show that you know uh, I use Facebook for certain things uh, I feel like Facebook sort of limited the way that we were able to use it when they changed their pages um, the, from the way that they were which was more of like anybody could post whatever they wanted on a page to now it's much more moderated where really only the creator of the page can post certain things so you know I use it to tell people when a new show is going up and I also solicit questions on Facebook but Facebook isn't great for the interactivity on the podcast and then the Google Plus is also something that I that I use quite a bit uh, I wish more people were on it because I feel like there there are some really cool things that you can do with Google Plus Primarily, I use it because I know how uh, positive it could be for if you're a blogger or a podcaster for helping get your content discovered in the Google ecosystem. And basically, I kind of feel like Google runs the casino. And so if the house is always going to win, I want to be on the side of the house. And so if Google tells me I should be using Google Plus to help you know, get my content out into the world, I'm going to use Google Plus and try to, you know, do whatever I can to get plus ones. And, uh, of course, YouTube is a big part of what I do, obviously, through when I do Google Hangouts. Uh, I want my stuff to be sort of, you know, found more easily by people who are looking for it. So uh, I, use, I use Google Plus. I feel like uh, that the thing, if you can get into a... Uh, uh, groups on Google Plus, I think, are probably the most powerful thing. I have heard um, different people at conferences uh, talk about Google Plus, and they say that you know Google Plus, you know, Facebook is for the place is for people that you already know, and Google Plus is for pa your passion. And so you don't go to Google Plus to see you know pictures of the people you went to high school with or you know or your nephew and see you know people that you uh, work in your office you go to Google Plus because you're interested in a certain topic and you find a lot of content about that specific topic and you know unfortunately there's not a ton of reality TV talk which is sort of my niche happening on Google Plus but there are is you know for certain groups like uh, I, I'm in, in a Breaking Bad group and there's always you know different uh, posts and stuff like that so you know whatever you're interested in you can find uh, an interesting uh, niche on that in Google Plus. And, and I was gonna tech stuff uh, especially. Yeah, I was gonna talk about YouTube as well. I'm on the EdReach network and we we have about. Um, I don't know the current count, maybe 15 um, education podcasts, and we only do we do one live. It's called the Google Educast, and they use Google Hangouts. Um, and you do maybe roughly one a week, a Google Hangout a week that's live. Well, no, it's probably more than that. I mean, right now with Big Brother, I'm doing you know three Big Brother ones alone because I'm doing basic. I mean, my formula, what I've been doing on my shows and and on uh, the reality side and the scripted side is my formula is I want to talk about a TV show live right after it airs. And I know a lot of people don't watch the TV live, but that's fine because there's a recording of everything we do, and you can watch it after you watch after you watch the show. So. 
TV show goes on the air, whether it's a reality show or a scripted show, after the show is over, we're going to talk about it live and be interactive and take your questions and have you know guests and, and talk about what just happened. And approximately how many people do you get in, in a live show? It depends how what the show is, obviously, or um, as a person who was on Survivor, Survivor is my biggest show. We've had anywhere from, you know, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 people live watching the, um, wa you know, watching the Hangouts. And, and how, do you, how do you manage that many, interacting with that many people? Well, I, you know, I'm very lucky that I have some uh, great uh, moderators that work with me. You know, what, one of the things I think is lacking on Google+, Plus, which I've seen on other streaming sites, which are technically inferior to what Google Plus is able to do, but they have an integrated chat, and I feel like that's one of the shortfalls I think that Google Plus has had, and, you know, I, I use Google Plus because I have faith that whatever, you know, Google Plus doesn't have, eventually I have more faith that it will have, as opposed to other sites catching up to what Google's able to do on the, on the video side, which I just don't see anybody ever being able to keep up with what Google's able to do. And so, um, you know, I use a third-party chat, which I want everybody who's watching the show to sort of be having that experience that they're talking about the show as well with other fans as the show is going on. And so I have an embedded third-party uh, chat going on. So while I'm sort of following it, and when you have that many people in the room, you know, it's sort of like it's just, you know, sc scrolling up the, the side of the screen. I'm sort of gotten good at not staring into the chat and reading what the people are saying whereas if my wife was doing a show with me and somebody said something about her it would completely say hey like uh hey you in the chat room said that thing you know i just saw that and so you know you sort of have to sort of just i, I follow it for to see when people are saying okay this is this is boring you know this is good this is good this is oh this is funny and there's a little bit of a lag so it's hard to really you know steer the ship by that but you can get some good instant feedback from people and you know often I feel like people uh, for either forget or don't know that I can read what they're saying as the show is going on so uh, for you know I feel like I get a lot of you know it's a very frank focus group of people who are you know talking about the show so it's sort of you know very instantaneous feedback and I, I also have going back to uh, the moderators. So I have moderators who are in the chat sort of making sure nobody's uh, being, you know, out of control or saying things that they shouldn't say or harassing anybody. And then I also have moderators on the actual show with me. Uh, you know, I have two people that work uh, closely with me in Scott St. Pierre and then also Jessica Frey, who's been a, a, you know, a moderator of my live shows for a long time now. And they're fielding questions from Twitter and from the YouTube channel. And then we get to a point in the show where I say, okay, let's get into taking questions from people. And then they're able to incorporate those. Uh, we use the comment tracker uh, for bringing questions onto the screen, which I feel like is a, uh, a very good you know, third-party uh, plug-in as well. And uh, we use that. And you know, I try to you know, take as many questions as we can and make the audience feel like we're talking about what they want to talk about. And uh, one thing that um, I've taken from you, uh, you know, I'm a full-time educator, hobbyist, podcaster, um, but I still see myself as a journalist. As part of this podcast, I have sort of a responsibility as a journalist. Um, I, you know, like I said, I have a professional relationship with Google, so sometimes I hear things from Googlers that I think, gosh, that'd be great to tell my audience, but I can't, or I have ed tech friends who would be considered celebrities in the ed tech world that tell me things in confidence that I can't say. You have the, you know, a similar situation where you work with CBS and there's certain things that you get from CBS you can't say. And you have friends who are survivors or other reality TV personalities that probably tell you things as a friend that you can't say. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that professionalism or why do you think that's important? Well, I think that, you know, that's what sort of separates somebody who is, you know, takes it seriously and doesn't and doesn't take it seriously. And I think that the audience comes to watch my show because they want access. Uh, there's, you know, as sort of like a gatekeeper of, okay, here's what, you know, here's how much access I can give of myself and of the people that, that come on the shows. I think you have to sort of manage that where, 
you know, you can't just sort of have a, a free-for-all of basically, you know, here's, you know, all of the inside secrets of Survivor. Not that there's any sort of state secrets or, or anything, anything like that. So, you know, you sort of want to, you know, give the best of both worlds, where it's like, here's, you know, here's access, here's, you know, a person you want to hear from, but, um, you know, you don't want to sort of say, like, hey, uh, you know, uh, I know this was before the show, but you told me about, you know, this, uh, you know, this fight you got into with somebody from your season that I want to talk about, or, you know, you, you know, it's, it's a little different between, you know, what you're talking about with, like, uh, like somebody, like, here's a new product Google is developing, and I might have, like, a piece of gossip. Uh, so it's a little, you know, um, we're not talking about serious uh, stuff a lot of the time. So, you know, I, I just think you, you just sort of want to don't not alienate the, uh, you know, the guests. And because even if you be like, oh, here's an exclusive, but now you lost a guest and you get a bad reputation, I think that's probably harder to come back from. And um, I will say, and my listeners probably, I'm sure I have no idea what I'm talking about, but your Randy Bailey uh, Christmas episode. Yes. I, I originally thought you crossed the line professionally, <laughs> and then I found out it was it was not a real episode. All right, uh, Troy, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Much so, like many of the people that are listening to the podcast, I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> and, and, and actually, one thing you do to kind of balance this, um, you have because uh, Ed Reach has joined Patreon, but we haven't got a lot. Of, we haven't had a lot of success with with getting patrons through Patreon, and um, you have a, a patron only podcast. Mm -hmm. um, that can you explain a little bit about how that helps you build an audience and how that helps build your sure. do your um does your audience know what patreon is uh they should if they've listened several episodes of this podcast because we've tried to build sort of that audience into ours so okay so um one of the things that i that i do is you know i I, I don't want to charge for uh, what what my shows you know I want my as many people as possible to listen to my shows, but at the same time I want to give something else back to the people who are supportive enough to contribute financially to making the shows happen. So what I decided to do a couple months ago was that I decided to do a once-a-month show only for the people who are the patrons of the podcast. And it's been a, a really big success that a lot of people want to hear the show. It's been fun. It's fun for me to do. We, we take calls from people. Um, you know, I am able to speak at liberty a little bit more than you know, just being in front of an open mic in front of the world where anybody could be listening. I know that the only people listening are the people who are the supporters of the show and none of the detractors are, are listening. And so it's, it's a win-win, I think, for everybody involved with it. And, you know, it's, I don't think that the, re the regular viewers are feeling, like, and are feeling like they're, you know, this isn't fair, you know, you, you're taking something away from us because you want us to, to pay money. And it's like, no, here's something that I've added extra for the people who are, you know, who are supporting the show. And so I feel like it's a, a, a good idea, and I feel like uh, there's been nothing but positive uh, feedback on it so far. And, and, I mean, one of the things that I've seen you do so well that, that we try, that we, uh, I've struggled with this podcast and all the EdReach shows, is the interaction. We have listeners out there, but the only time that I hear from them is usually, occasionally I'll get a tweet, um, but usually it's I'm at a conference or something and someone will come up and tell me they've listened to the podcast. You do a great job of, uh, and I think it's hard for podcasts in general to get that interaction with the audience, um, you know, because people don't retweet audio very often and things like that. Um, how, how important is that, or, or how do you think you've been successful at that? Well, I think part of it is also the subject matter. With you know, with all due respect for to what to what you do as an educator, you know, I feel like what what we do, you know, on on talking about Survivor and and TV, and so it's a distraction. You know, it's the kind of stuff that you that you engage in a lot of times. Now, a lot of people like you know do very productive things you know, while they're listening to the podcast, and it, and it helps them get through, you know, things that are sort of unpalatable uh, tasks that they might be doing during the day. Um, you know, I feel like it's, it's just fun, you know, 
and I feel like it's easier to get people to participate in something that's just uh, you know uh, you know fun as opposed to something that uh, is is more of an educational thing and also you know where you're doing stuff that's like you're your education professionals you probably are using your Twitter for business as opposed to a lot of the people who are listening to my stuff are using their Twitter for nonsense and and don't mind you know tweeting silly things at me because they're you know their boss isn't isn't reading their Twitter or is not they're not following anybody from their work life on Twitter so you know it's a it's a little bit of you know apples and oranges for in the you know uh, entertainment space. Uh, what do you think the future of podcasting looks like? Or where do you think it's going? Troy, in the future, everyone will have their own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and nobody will listen to any of them. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it is, you know, where a, a few years back, there weren't nearly as many podcasts. And as podcasting becomes easier and easier to do, there's, you know, I, I've seen even in the last year where I, you know, I go on YouTube and I see, you know, where, you know, there might have been a couple of people reviewing a, a show a year ago, you know, now I'll go on YouTube and I see, you know, maybe there's like 20 or 30 people reviewing a, an episode of Game of Thrones or, a, you know, or an episode of Big Brother and stuff like that. So the barrier to entry is almost nothing at this point. So I feel like the, you know, I do feel like the cream will rise to the to the top. And I feel like just being, uh, looking and sounding and being professional is probably what's going to separate the people who are just the, you know, um, the amateur people who are just sort of like, you know, in their, you know, uh, in their bedroom and it's not lit well and it's, and it's hard to hear what they're saying. I think that's probably, like, I just wish that, you know, I, I I don't know what I wish. I I mean, I, I, always, I wish it was easier for people to find my show. So uh, you know, I think what it'll it'll come down to. I don't know if you know necessarily rewarding you know things that you know. I think that the what how it should be is probably the interactivity should carry the day. So and I know that Google is you know looks at this stuff where you know who has plus ones, who has likes, who has interactions, and I think that that's probably the stuff that should you know, rise to the surface more and the stuff that's really not getting a lot of views, that's not getting a lot of interaction, I feel like that stuff should probably be more towards uh more towards the bottom. But, you know, I, I think they know what I think they know what they're doing. I think it's gonna move more in that direction as well though. Well I think too that's one uh, a problem with YouTube is they don't get rid of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of videos that people have posted that have sat idle for four or five years, but when you do searches, they get in the way of some of the stuff that you might really want to see. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of feel like that, you know, I you know YouTube does this to a degree, but I feel like there should be a little bit more of a, you know, reward for people that have been, you know, more established on the on the platform and are, and are doing, um, you know, again, I, I'm sure it's part of the, it's part of the algorithm, but, you know, somebody who's just, Who's you know just started a YouTube channel? You know their stuff could you know you know outrank your stuff um, for whatever reason. It's hard to get a good sense of how that is uh, you know how that that all is is worked out. How many subscribers do you have on YouTube? On uh, Rob is a podcast. I think we have uh, I think uh, about seventeen thousand five hundred YouTube uh, subscribers. And on post show recaps, I think we're about fifty three hundred. And uh, can you explain to the listeners why you separated them? I know one's reality and one's live TV. That's yeah, because I the the idea was, and I was covering you know Breaking Bad and Walking Dead on Rob has a podcast, but I felt like for the average person who was a fan of these scripted shows, I felt like coming to a website that was like, hey, we've got Survivor, Big Brother, and the you know, I felt like that wasn't um, there's what. I like to talk a lot about Venn diagrams, and I felt like the overlap of those people where there's a lot of people in my community, but I feel like the average fan of one of these other shows probably isn't also watching Survivor or watching Big Brother. And so I felt like I was sort of putting a limit on how big those other scripted podcasts could get by 
post, by posting them on a site that was about reality TV. So I felt like I wanted to, um, you know, use the things I learned from the reality TV podcast and then incorporate them to have a successful uh, sh scripted TV podcast. And I also felt like, you know, if any of these reality shows ever get canceled or anything like that, I also want to sort of diversify my portfolio so I could podcast no matter, you know, what's on TV. Do you think um, video podcasts could replace audio podcasts, or do you think there's two different audiences there? I don't know if it's necessarily two different audiences, but I, I don't think that an audio podcast is going to go anywhere because, you know, people are always going to, you know, be, you know, whether they're, they're until Google comes up with a self-driving car, people are always going to be uh, in traffic or running errands or, you know, looking at Excel sheets or, you know, washing the dishes. And so you can't always look at something as well as listening to it. So, you know, radio has always, has always been around. I don't think that, you know, spoken, you know, audio conversations are going to go anywhere, uh, you know, anytime soon. And that Google self-driving car is a lot closer than I think we realize. Um, Good. I can't wait. I can't wait to get one. I think it's more the laws need to catch up and, and uh, public perception needs to catch up before they can mass produce them. But, um. Yeah. Well, that's a whole uh, podcast right there. <laughs> yeah, well, we talk we talk about Google quite a bit. Um, so when yeah. you started embracing Google Plus on your podcast, I was first happy step about that. embrace Google Plus. Second step, Google Car that drives itself, <laughs> and then I can watch and I can watch Netflix while uh, while I'm going places. And, and you've actually done a podcast from your car, so you could actually yes. podcast more. Yes. Well, I, my wife and I, we have our, our first uh, baby, uh, and he's going to be uh, 10 months old uh, next week. But it's, it's sort of crazy to us that we were pretty convinced, like, you know, he'll never drive a car, which uh, is good because teenagers are very uh, reckless drivers. So uh, that's going to save me a lot of money on car insurance. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is kind of very off topic, but I, I, with my middle school students, we had that discussion about, the future of the self-driving car, and a lot of them said, "No, you have to have this rite of passage at 16 when you get your driver's license." And, and I said, "Why do you need that rite of passage? That's just a created rite of passage that we, you know, we don't need it." Yeah, you don't need it. Maybe you can have like some sort of like uh, you know car mitzvah uh, when you turn 16, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then you get to uh, now you're a man now you get to go and uh, have a here's your uh, app to get the self-driving car to come pick you up. <laughs> um, so can you tell my listeners where they can find you, uh, where you're at on Twitter, your YouTube channel, things like that? Sure. My, my website uh, where you can find all of my reality TV podcasts is robhasawebsite.com. I am also on my scripted TV website, which is postshowrecaps.com, and uh, we're covering shows right now. Of You know, it's the summer. It's a little slower, uh, but we're covering uh, The Leftovers right now. Uh, the Strain is another show that we're covering. I also and I have started a Seinfeld rewatch project on Post Show Recaps, and we just finished uh, Game of Thrones and 24, uh, House of Cards, and shows like that uh, in the spring. And then on Twitter, I'm just at Rob Sesternino, and I'm not sure if you could uh, spell that or not, but uh, that's uh, <laughs> if you go to uh, robhaswebsite.com slash Twitter, uh, you could find me there. And, and thank you. I mean, I get a lot of – I do podcasting with my students, and, and like I said, Joan and I will do a follow-up podcast on how to use that in the classroom, but um, I get a lot of questions from teachers that don't know anything about how to get a podcast started and how to build a podcast, and um, so I think you have a lot of good things for my listeners that you, you've done it, and you've done it successfully. And so I think I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Well, thank you. And if anybody is going to be at the uh, Podcast Movement Conference in Dallas uh, next month, I'm going to be speaking on the subject of how podcasters can use YouTube to help uh, grow their podcast. So we'll be talking about a lot of this same uh, stuff, Google+, YouTube, uh, why people should be doing a live podcast, and you know how being in the YouTube search engine could help you grow and build an audience and monetize on YouTube. 
And quickly before we wrap up, you've 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 been to the YouTube studios, correct? Yes, yes. I just shot there last. I I've actually taken a couple of uh, seminars there, and I shot at the YouTube Space LA last week. That's um, you know, as as a Google certified teacher, I know a lot of uh, Googlers out in California, but also teachers who do a lot of work with YouTube and Google out in California. So. They would be very envious to hear that. <laughs> yes, uh, I believe you know you need ten thousand subscribers to uh, to uh, schedule a shoot there. But I, I that is it uh, can educate. I know that if you have a dot org, I think you can get around that. I'm not sure uh, if that's the same for educators. I'll have to ask. I know I know uh, there is a small number of YouTube star teachers um, that I'm friends with, and I'll ask them. Like Frank E. J. Grande. <laughs> no, um, not not uh, my listeners probably have no idea who that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, so when I did my Google Teacher Academy, they actually started a program called YouTube, yeah, uh, YouTube Star Teachers, and they trained us on YouTube. So that was a really uh, great experience. You know, I basically said, "Hey, I'm coming here this day, and uh, you know, here's what I want to shoot," and they said, okay, uh, great, what equipment do you need? And I said, okay, I need this and this and this. And if I was going to do a shoot like I did on that day, you know, it easily would have cost me, you know, in the, you know, well over $1,000 and probably, into, you know, $2,000 between the studio and the equipment that I got to use. And YouTube just said, you know, hey, you're producing videos for us. So, uh, you know, here, just use, use all the stuff for free. And I had issues uh, with, uh, you know, I'm not a tech, you know, I, I know how to make a podcast, but, when it comes to you know a, f a film shoot, you know I'm sort of like uh, like how does this wireless lav work? And they can, you know they 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 assisted us and you know it was a really really great experience and uh, you get a uh, free uh, cappuccino also. <laughs> they have a coffee bar there. It's good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Well, thanks again for your time. Um, uh, what you have to say is really helpful for my listeners. And thank you very much for having me, Troy, and I appreciate it.